Uh, welcome this morning. Thank you for coming. My name is Justine Richardson. I'm the director here of the Arboretum, uh, and this is uh, one of the um, activities as part of our Arb Expo. If any of you have uh, been to our plant sale? Let's see how many people have been to a plant sale, have a plant or a tree shrub in your yards that you're carrying and have run onto. So uh, we have had a history of these amazing, huge, enormous plant sales. COVID, of course, uh, restricts that. And, uh, we can't have uh, 3,000 people elbowing each other out to get to that last um, native uh, tree that they're trying to get to. So we've shifted to a, a virtual plant sale and we had a series of activities as part of our ARB Expo over this weekend. Thank you so much for joining us and participating. Um, it is my honor to be here and to have um, been over the last year working with um, with Dawn on um, on the project that she's brought to us. Um, I want to start, of course, um, by acknowledging this land uh, that the Arboretum is on, that uh, I and our wonderful staff here have the, um, have the honor of stewarding and shaping and uh, sharing uh, with our community and, and beyond. Um, and we offer a land acknowledgement course as a step towards understanding and reconciling the past and the history that we all share, and moving forward towards a shared future. Um, this land where the Arboretum now grows has been home to plants and wildlife for millions of years. It was home to indigenous peoples, of course, long before settlers arrived, including Adawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. We recognize the Between the Lakes Treaty on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, on which the University of Wealth and the Arboretum now sit. And we recognize the spirit of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant. And the teaching that it represents that there's one earth that we all have to share and between. As an Arboretum, now the land supports native trees as well as trees carried here by recent visitors and planted through conservation efforts and seed exchanges. And that's a really beautiful metaphor for the people on the land and the things that are growing on. On the land, I believe. Um, and recognizing this living history and our relations in it is one part of our efforts to understand the land, care for the flora and fauna that call it home, and contribute to a positive sense of culture and identity for all people in our communities. Specifically, as a green space and a land based hub of the University of Wilmington, we're dedicated to research and teaching and outreach and community engagement right on campus. And we are committed to walking step by step with indigenous colleagues, researchers, students, partners, organizations, and community members towards learning truth, seeking reconciliation, and braiding knowledges together towards a shared future. And I think one really beautiful representation of, uh, of an attempt to do that is this project that. Dawn has been doing over the course of this year and we continue to do. Um, how to draw up tree, trees, mental health, and creativity. Uh, Dawn Matheson is a participatory uh, community based artist here in Guelph. Um, she's brought in a beautiful sensibility to the project that she's been doing here in the Arboretum. And I'm just going to turn it over to her to present what she's been doing and this project as it's, as it's grown over the years. Thank you. And thank you, Dawn. Thank you so much. I think we got to wipe this every time, all of the protocols. So thanks everybody for coming and braving it. Hopefully we're doing it normal times. Thank you here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a uh, magician. I'm going to pull around over there. <laughs> Sorry for the noise. Um, obviously, can you sit right there and save that seat for you? We don't know who she is. <laughs> um, okay. So, Here, sweetheart. I'll just mention um, what that was that was on before. So you just might be wondering about it if you happen to walk in. Is everybody can hear okay? Yeah. I guess it's a funny setup. Okay. So, that was a older project of mine. I've always partnered with different members of the community. So, that was one from a few years ago, commissioned by Art Gallery of Wealth. I was Ontario um, Arts Council Artist in Schools, and I worked with a troupe of deaf youth and youth with hearing loss. Uh, to create video projects. So that was one partnered with the uh, Guelph Outdoor School, which was super fun, <coughs> or GoPro um, cameras and they ran around. So that's a project that Justine was uh, lovely enough to allow me to set up on the stage to give another sense of 
connection to nature. So I really want to thank the Arboretum. Um, it's, it's neat to feel such a connection to this place, but then to meet the people who work here and who are caring and tending to uh, the planet, which really are the superheroes of this generation. I mean, these are the people that will save the world. So it's really, really cool. And there, there's many in the audience that are working with staff here and up here as well that um, we all need to be thankful for if you're working in this and studying in this field. Uh, so I'm going to do something funny that I wouldn't normally do to start, but um, I'm kind of trying to learn to do things a bit differently. So I want to ask if, I, it's kind of like a grounding. I wondered if everyone can just look out the window for a, a few minutes and just actually take a look and see what we see here. This is something I try to do. Um, it's a mental health trick, but it's also just a grounding technique in nature. And I try to, uh, to visualize where I am, and, and I can see now where the leaves blowing in the tree. I don't need to know what type of tree that is to find it beautiful. I can see some uh, blossoms. There's some humans out there moving, and the way the light's playing. And sitting there and taking that time to recognize where I am is a new thing I'm doing to do what's actually a, a, a neuropsychological trick of, of stimulating the prefrontal cortex, which is your senses, your executive functioning, your reasoning. And when we ground ourselves in sight and say hello to these people, that's the other part of our planet, is when we ground ourselves in, in what we see and hear and smell and taste, and remember where we are here, it's, it's stimulating the good uh, chemicals in our body. And that's just one first thing that happens in nature. It happens no matter what, because you can smell a lot of different things, and you hear things, and you see colors, and you're mesmerized by patterns and design, and that for me has been huge in my mental health. So thanks for doing that. I also want to recognize the people that are here, and I see a lot of family members and really good friends, and all my work is always about relationships, and I work with them hard. I'm not always successful at relationships, but I try really hard, because that's the only way I think we really can survive. Yeah, um, otherwise, we have isolation. So I want to look at everyone here and say thank you for coming up here. Um, the, um, I want to mention as well, I did write some notes, but I want to say who's sitting up here as well, because regrettably, I have to do the most talking today, only because this is the brain where this project comes from, but not really just me. I've kind of got it from everyone I'm, I'm with, but I, I need to be the one to explain it. So. But before um, you'll meet these, these uh, folks here in a little bit, but I'll just tell you who they are right now. And they're members of what's become the Tree Friends. People who have, um, they're people who peopled this project. This project was, was in my dreams, it was just going to be me and a tree, and we would get married, and it would be beautiful. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's people that are everywhere. And, <laughs> and if you try to get away from them, you actually get ill. Um, so it ended up that my mental health care team has extended in a very unconventional way to include trees and tree people. So these are people from my mental health care team, which is a very unusual thing to say when you might think of um, medicalization as a mental illness. But, so I'm really, really grateful for them. Um, and I'll tell you how I met them. But you're going to see Sean Fox, who's where is he? Two down for me. He works here. A lot of people might know him. Um, he'll introduce himself in a bit, but he is the manager of horticulture and curator of collections and conservation. But for me, he's this gentle, gentle, kind soul that knows and loves the trees and really cares for them. So I'm really great that he's here. And Chris Early is someone I've known for a while. He did work with my brother in the lab here. My brother's a biologist as well. And Chris, to me, I wrote a magazine piece about him once, and I did describe him as so excited about nature you can see his tail wagging. <laughs> you couldn't deny it. Like, there's a tail under there. Yeah. So he's the interpretive biologist, education coordinator. And if you're ever talking to him outside, he's not listening to anything you're saying. He's like, <laughs> Honestly, like, if you tell him some terrible story, he also goes, shh. He's only looking away at the shit so it's beautiful. And another friend that I have up here, you'll see, is Moggy while we're me, who I've done a few projects with um, because he's just an amazing, wise, resilient, and very, very kind hearted person. And good fortune has it, he works up here at the University of Guelph, so I've been able to bring him into the project. He says he's a machine operator on grounds, but he really is planting trees on campus and caring and tending to them. Um, you're going to hear from Greg Kennedy, who's a Jesuit farmer and the spiritual director from Ignatius Jesuit Center, who's joined the tree team. He'll be on a video. Um, you're going to meet Byron Murray from the Guelph Outdoor School, who is someone who's got to be the most curious person I've ever met in my life in far as 
really asking questions and really connecting with nature. He's an amazing human to be around. And the other person on the video that you're going to meet is Mamona Hossein, who's become a nice friend of mine. She's an eco-psychologist and is teaching eco-psychology courses here. So I think there's one coming up. So if people want to take it from her, she's really, really a lovely mother and an activist for nature. Um, two other people who are not present, but they're advisors to me on this, I'm going to mention is J.D. Derbyshire. And J.D., I've been a fan of their work for quite a while. They are a performance artist and comedian, but they're an activist for mad arts. And I'm going to talk about what mad arts is. Uh, J.D. lives in uh, Vancouver. And my own doctor, uh, Carolyn Pelletier, she is not here today as well, but she's my medical psychotherapist that I work with, and she's just fantastic and from a very conventional system, but believes this project of me um, having a tree as my main therapist is better than she can ever provide for me, so that's pretty cool. I'm just going to give you a tiny bit of background. Uh, not a lot, but I work in a million different contracts, hundreds of different jobs, including like delivering phone books or telemarketing, as every other artist <laughs> to have another less glamorous side. But I have been a research project manager up here with um, a project with differences and disabilities. I've been a video resident, a lot of video residencies. I've been, um, I had a, a this project at the Art Gallery of Guelph. I've had a lot of contracts, and I was lucky enough to, to produce to produce the, the sound the sound walk of the Innose field trip you can hear today. Uh, Arboretum um, Year collaboration. And I'm also currently was, was advising producer and editor for the Shine Pass, which is a mental health podcast run in the Wellness Center. And it's just awesome. It's students talking about mental illness and how they live with mental illness and how they live well with mental illness. Um, and I'm also a podcast producer for uh, Family Relations and Nutrition's um, editor uh, for their podcast. So, anyways, doodly do. The main thing I do is someone told me what I do because I don't didn't know what it was, and they said it's called social practice art. And I'm going to bring that up just because it'll help figure out how this project works. And social practice art is socially engaged, engaged art that relies on relationships. Again, that's what I will always work on relationships. So it's about um, collaborating and participating with individuals, communities, and institutions in the creation of participatory art. So I don't. I hope I don't come and impose my ideas on all my partners. I work very hard to get out of the way of that. And it's a space where everyone, and it doesn't always work, where everyone can be heard and included, and not just the dominant culture. And it's presented in accessible public spaces. And for me, I like unexpected spaces, like train stations, parks, fountains, alleyways, balconies. So this project, um, it's kind of the simplest thing in the world. There's nothing unique to it. It's going out and bonding with nature. It's what uh, this fellow next to me has done his entire life and didn't have to create an art project around in order to do it. Um, if that's fair to say here. <laughs> okay. And um, yet, um, it's really about reconnecting. I don't know if you heard the Suzanne Samar talk where she said, it isn't about the environment that's out there around us. We are the environment. You know, and that whole notion that's so lost um, for many of us that I think really does affect us and does cause isolation and can cause a very, very huge emotional distress and separation. So it's about that. And, um, you know, I don't know, Peter doesn't mind that this is uh, Peter uh, beside me, who I don't think I actually produced. My goodness, I didn't. Peter Schuller, I'm so sorry. I was looking all around down here. This is Elder Peter Schuller from the Songs of the Credit, and he's an artist, photographer, and may I say, a battler of uh, Buckthorn on his property. <laughs> and he's a very vital person in this project, and he will be speaking as well in a moment, so excuse me for uh, missing that. But he told me a story, um, and I'll, I'll just say what it, it really resonated with me, is that we are woven into the blanket. We're not sitting on top of it. Of course, he said it in a much more eloquent way, but um, that's what I'm working at, is how can I weave myself into the blanket or recognize that I already am. So the project is called How to Draw a Tree. It's a participatory art project that brings together individuals living with mental illness. The eventual goal is you and University of Guelph students, together with trees for a year-long, uh, September to uh, May, um, creative, caretaking, reciprocal engagement that will culminate in a sound walk. This is where the art is. This process will be documented in audio. All this meeting of the trees and the tree team and self-exploration will be documented. It'll become a sound block here at the Arboretum. Um, and then the beautiful thing that's going to happen as part of the reciprocation goes is whatever tree that individual bonds with will be um, will have a sister tree, a sapling that will be planted on the main campus. 
um, in what I'm hoping will eventually be, these are all the hopes for it, it's not in set in stone yet, set in earth yet, but the, um, the hope is that a sister tree to the tree that the, the individual bonds with here at the Arboretum will be planted on campus as, as kind of an emotional support tree and eventually will be a full circle of these trees that will have a plaque that will link to this project and to the Arboretum's work to people connected with trees and to mental wellness on campus. <clears throat> That's the dream. So, um, yeah, um, I, what about mental health and how that came about? This is kind of my, I don't know if anybody here, well, people my numbers, I was thinking of my hair club for men that where there's a commercial that was always that said, um, not only am I the president of Hair Club for Men, I'm also a member. So that's where I come into this. It's not only do I work with uh, people with differences and disabilities, um, and actually most of the time I work with people that have what uh, God has maybe considered visible differences or disabilities, uh, physical differences, or things you can see, um, cultural, or... Um, but the amazing thing about all that work is always behind that work, that primary disability is always a secondary difference or disability, and it's always mental illness. And that is almost more difficult to live with than the primary disability. So for me, the work is inevitable, but now I'm focusing on mental illness because it's prevalent, it's everywhere. And I, myself, have had an early diagnosis of mental illness from my childhood, and I live with it, and I live with it very well, mostly because of good fortune of having fantastic parents who were here that gave me so much support and love and stability. I was lucky, I was born lucky, and so I've made it through this journey and, and live with mental illness. Um, I don't know what's called mental illness, I'm going to have people can call what they want. But So um, that's why it's necessary for me to do the first sound walk. So that's what's happening. This How to Draw a Tree is me doing this. Um, and what time is it? 15? 25. Okay, I'm going to wrap up in five minutes. So that's why it's important for me to do this, because I didn't think it was fair to me to go and ask uh, a student um, living here, or staying on campus, to go and practice meeting trees and, and relying on this idea and then make a radio uh, audio documentary about it. I had to do it myself. It's only fair. Uh, there's so much shame around mental illness and I thought if I'm asking people to expose themselves to that, I guess I have to do that myself. So that's this process. So I'm currently creating that sound block. And this is where everybody here comes in. <laughs> because I started, uh, I got a Canada Council Research Fund for this, so the research work has been done now and I'm into production. I thought I needed to test the waters to build this um, flexible but authentic and safe structure of supports for this experiment, this creative engagement between humans and what I've learned to call the more than human world. And also it's perfect with COVID, you know, bonding with trees and COVID. So um, this, this is where everyone comes in. So I um, started to try to learn about trees and um, the project was here actually a little bit before Justine started, when she was hired, I was ecstatic because I know how much she's connected to social practice and media arts and community engagement. So it was wonderful to, to have the project continue. So it, it was about me walking and talking and sharing stories and seeing what comes out when I'm out in nature. And it's been miraculous. I've walked with several tree experts, people that don't have a connection to nature but have mental health, and the stories that have come out that we've shared have been amazing. Trees have been kind of my main therapy, whether I knew it or not, and I never knew why. We, early years, we grew up out west. My parents took us camping a lot, and I was always felt good in the forest. I, I feel calm, um, no judgment, there's some kind of emergence of the senses, and creative ideas and imagination come out, so it's a really amazing place to be grounded. So I wanted to use trees, and that's when I met a bunch of these, uh, these wonderful folks here. The first one I do want to mention um, is Peter. Um, he was really important to me and I had to try to find someone that I could learn from because when I first came up to the Arboretum, I've been here many, many times, I came up here and usually I just hike and walk and all this, but this time, now that I knew that I got funding for a project to partner with trees, and just even remember this, I got out of the car and I couldn't even look up. I just felt, I, sh I, I felt like um, shame, shameful that I hadn't asked the trees if they wanted to partner with me, which sounds it sounds weird, but it shouldn't sound weird. <laughs> like, I hadn't said, do you want to do a project with me? Like, I just imposed on the fact that I'm going to go and take these trees and I'm going to make them into my work. And I couldn't even look at them. One of the walks I had was with Justine, and I was like, before I could get her, I was like, I can't even look up at the trees. And that's where I realized I didn't even know how to properly create the forest. 
in spite of the fact that I've spent so many years in the forest. And this is where I knew I needed to meet someone like Peter, who's, uh, I don't want to um, misrepresent, but my understanding is that the separation between the human and the green world hasn't hit, or it didn't happen, and it has happened in my culture. So I wanted someone that could help pull me back, bring me back. Um, so the team began, and there's Sean, and there's Chris, and I'll talk about the team now, and then I'm going to ask them to um, to talk a little bit about their connection to trees um, and their um, their own uh, how they work with them and what they do for them in their professional life or just even in their personal life, and also in um, the connection to this idea that I've come up with and whether they see it as valid or how they see it um, helping both reciprocally helping um, society as well as the busy natural environment in, in what is a parallel crisis, a climate crisis and a mental health crisis. So, uh, okay, so I think I can let you know that the, that I've met these folk and I'm hoping that each one will be able to uh, join me in the next stage, which is called How to Draw Forest, which was the initial goal of the project, but as I say, I felt like I had to do this first, and that is where, um, with the Wellness Centre at the University of Guelph, where I'm working with the podcast, they're going to help me find three students with lived experience of mental illness to go through the same uh, process process that I've gone through, where they will walk, um, maybe not walk, wander, whatever abilities uh, everyone has, um, and they will meet the trees, and they will talk, and then eventually they will choose one tree, which is what happened to me. And again, Peter said, well, you don't actually choose the tree, the tree chooses you, which it's very nice in theory, but for me, I was like, how in the heck is a treatment choose me? I thought it was impossible, but it happened. You'll have to come on the soundwalk to hear who chose me. Um, and then there's the sit, and that is sitting with the tree for a prolonged period of time and not talking, and, and learning and listening, learning and listening for two the tree. And then there is the share, which is the production of the audio walk. And the last thing is um, the reciprocation, which is the planting of the tree that will be led by my mom and the grounds team. So, from here, I would like to ask if we could start, if um, that's okay. Oh, some of the institutional partnerships is um, the Arboretum, the Wellness Centre, and the UG uh, Grounds Department. Uh, so, really grateful for some of those, uh, uh, that support and those partnerships. So, if I could ask, if I could pass this mic down and just um, have, have Peter um, introduce himself, uh, or do you want to stand, or what do you prefer? Okay. I'll bring it up to the front. Is that close enough? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you can't hear, you're not going to miss much. Bonjour. Bonjour, Diogo. Thank you for coming. It's hard to do, but it's not very hard. Bonjour, my chumas. Here is Manado. Nikuit kizi katmong mong. Nikuit kizi sa mga libre kizi sa mga mga nikuit sa mga kwarto. Which <laughs> So, who disagrees with that? <laughs> <laughs> and don't you blame for me at all. I don't have too much of my language. I never heard it when I was growing up. And um, what I said is something that I say every day. And I gave thanks for uh, the sun, the moon, Stars, clouds, the trees, the animals, the birds, the fish, the insects. Basically for all our creation. And I mentioned the trees. And then the land acknowledgement um, that was given, I was happy to hear that the rest of creation is mentioned. Because when most land ecologists are given, 
the rest of creation like double. Which is kind of ironic because it's called a landing launcher. So the land is like double. The environment is like double. Which is something that my ancestors would not do. They would start first with the rest of creation. Because it's fully understood that without the rest of creation, you cannot survive. But the rest of creation can survive and thrive without human beings. <coughs> and, um, so, when I was asked to uh, participate in this, um, I tried to always help out if I can help out. And sometimes I don't even know if I help out. But what I do is, yeah, I don't have any written down. All my words are in this can right here. This is the can statement I'm making. And uh, in this can is what we would call a sema. And in this can is tobacco. And so what I do is I take some of this tobacco and uh, I offer it to a tree. And I put it in a fire. I could load it into a pipe. But I use this tobacco um, before. I do anything. And um, I brought with me a drum. Not that I'm going to sing or like that, but I don't want to hurt your ears. <laughs> but I wanted to show this drum because the outside is made of wood. The drumstick is made out of wood. And there are two ceremonies that I have attended. <clears throat> And central to both of those ceremonies is a tree. And the one ceremony is a Lakota sun dance. At the center of that circle is a tree. The other, sun, uh, the other ceremony is the initiation ceremonies into the Medellin Lodge. And central to that, in that lodge, is a tree. That tree is uh, Mekpiknabi, which is basically the tree of life. The last night I dreamt about trees, and I dreamt about that tree breathing in and breathing out. And if that tree stops breathing in and breathing out, we're going to lose oxygen. If we cut all these trees down, we're going to cook. We will cook ourselves. And then this battle I'm having with buckthorn, which is an invasive species, it chokes out everything. It shades out everything. If there's enough of them there, there's nothing growing under there at all. And when I started that, project to try to get rid of this buckhorn, I took some of this tobacco and I asked this question, what can I learn from this tree? What can this buckhorn teach me? And so I started to study how does this buckhorn work. It grows really fast, it outcompetes the other trees. It gets its leaves first in the spring before other trees do, except for maybe the little. And the leaves stay on later than the rest of the trees. So when it shades out the rest of the trees, the young trees that are coming from the native trees, they don't have a chance to grow. And I looked at that tree. And I said, why does this look so familiar? Why is this process so easy to understand? And I related to that tree 
and what it does to colonialism. So this uses the same methods that was used upon us as indigenous people. In shading out the young, it kind of equates to the residential school system where the young children were put so that they couldn't learn their culture or learn their language. When I use this to battle, I say it's a really scary thing to do because you never know what words are going to come from this camp. And sometimes those words or uncomfortable. And sometimes those words kind of shake up their existence. But I think at this time, in the history of this planet, it's time to shake up our existence. Because these trees have something to say. These trees have always had something to say, but we've forgotten how to listen. We have forgotten where we're supposed to be, and as Don mentioned, our thread is not supposed to be on top of the blanket, it's supposed to be woven into the blanket. And that blanket that she's talking about is the blanket of creation. We as human beings have drawn our threads out and we're sitting on top of the blanket. And we're eating the blanket. And we need to weave ourselves back in again. But we need to understand what does that mean. My ancestors, they had a, a lot of different ways of looking at things. And for over 500 years, we tried to share these thoughts perspective. And it's a strange thing. You can go all the way around the world and talk to indigenous people and you'll find the same common threads. And the really strange thing is it takes years and years and years for those thoughts to be transferred. And they can only be transferred When the colonizer invents that thought, when they can take ownership from that thought or that understanding, then they will accept it. But they will say that's our discovery. Just the same as Christopher Columbus said he discovered Pearl Island. I call that Columbus. <coughs> when they come up with this great idea, we discovered this. I call it Columbus. And three or four years ago, they discovered, they discovered, that there's a memory carried in DNA, which is something we've been telling them 500 years. <coughs> we call it blood memory. You're born memory. <coughs> If you come from a state, like say, for instance, you came from Syria, you came from Iraq, you came from a country that's been torn by war, you are born with that trauma. That's something that we know all about. And how do you fix that? You can go and sit with those trees. Those trees will change the way you think. And this sounds like a really strange thing. Don't wait for some scientists to discover that for you. We don't have time to do it. We have to change the way we treat the rest of creation. We are running out of time. That, you go out there, 
If you were to come around and find those buckthorn trees, every person that was visited that spot says exactly the same thing. They always say, it's so peaceful here. I can feel it. Every time I go there, I take some of this tobacco. I say, what's your name? I need to say, you should be on some of I say, hello, my relatives. What are you doing today? And I'm talking to those relatives up there that aren't human. And when you recognize non human relatives, the non human relatives will recognize you. Don't wait for some scientist to tell you that. Go discover for yourself. You will see things you've never seen before. You might see an insect. Or a bird that you've never seen before. You just keep going and visiting those relatives, and they will show themselves to you. It's a peaceful place to be to go sit with the trees. And we need that to understand what peace is. As I was driving here, I was thinking about. The mess that the world is in since 9 11. And how much destruction was put on innocent people who had nothing to do with that? How many people were bombed, killed, who had absolutely nothing to do with 9 11? But that was the retribution. And I posted on Facebook that it's kind of strange that 9 11 is at the front of the news today. But the over 6,000 graves, unmarked graves of children in residential schools is hidden in a drawer in a spare office of the editor's desk. Did I say that wrong? I did. It's hidden away. And that's because, and I can relate this to this myself, sometimes we do things which are not nice. And we hope we never get caught. We hope no one ever finds out that we did this nasty thing. And collectively, Canada does not want to know about that nasty thing. We don't want to know about that. But if we don't know about it, we're liable to do the same thing again. As a matter of fact, we're still doing it. We're still taking those children away from their parents. We're still putting them in care. We're still doing that. The trees can tell you something about that. When a tree is about to die, it sends its nutrients to other young trees. When a tree is sick, other trees help it. And I don't think it really matters so much what kind of tree it is, because it's all joined together with all this fungi under the ground, and they all get along. If you look out there, they're not all the same. They're all different. Even the ones that are the same, you can't find two trees that look the same. In our teachings, they say there's only one human race. And this is true. There's only one human race. And we need to accept the fact that there's only one human race. And that we're no different than those trees. They're all different. But they're all 
all the same thing. When we come to looking at trees, I got a message when I was standing around this tree at the Sundance. And that message was to make things out of wood that people throw away, that people see as junk. Let them see the beauty in the trees. That's what I started to do. This drum frame is made from a pallet. The pallet was thrown into a dumpster and I fished it out. And I took it home and I took it apart. And I made this drum frame. And inside, with Vernon, there's a story of that. And on this drumstick, there's four trees on there. That's the message I got from the trees, to help the trees, to recognize what they're doing. To recognize that we need to get along, whether it's humans, whether it's trees, animals. We're not the boss. We all want to be in control, but none of us are. We have the illusion of being in control. Put it down the throat. Tell me how much control you have. Hold. If you have a sudden illness, how much control do you have? We don't have control. If we have the ability to change our direction, it's time we do that. It's time we listen to the trees. Whether it's for your own mental health, whether it's for your friend's health, the planet's health, we need to listen. And Don doesn't know this, but my wife does. She says, you know, you talk to <laughs> so, I have to, uh, if I disappear, it's because I have to go back to my own community to talk there. Um, so, I want to say, Jimmy Glitch is a delegate. Thank you for listening to what I have to say. And I, I uh, apologize if whatever came out of this can <laughs> might have you or shake you up. But whatever comes out of this can, Beyond my control. Because I'm not in control. So, Jim English? Jim English. Yeah, every time uh, Peter has spoken with me, it's such a different experience because I have to relax myself. It's amazing because I'm a hurried person and I've got to slow down and listen. And things resonate with me, like what Peter said, much further down the road as well. I take it in and then I make so thank you very much, Peter. And Scoot, when you need to, I'm going to move on to John. So I'm hoping that Peter will be the first person that whoever the three students are get to walk with because they first learned about being part of the land. I want to go over to Sean. This is Sean Fox, and I met Sean and had a walk with him and spoke to me about I don't know, an hour at one point, and we just shared so many stories beyond dreams, and he's been a really gentle person that right away I felt like they could tell everything to and that's what the project has been about for me. So Sean, do you have a few minutes to talk a little bit about what you do and maybe the project? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and uh, which, uh, thank you for your time. Um, yeah, I was invited by Don to come along uh, on her journey. Um, I, I, I guess I should start by saying I've been interested in fascinating plants my, my whole life from a young age. I've been here at the Airbnb for many years, uh, caring for trees and the plants and the gardens. Uh, and Don invited me along to, uh, I guess, be a bit of an advisor as far as telling some stories about the trees and, and what we see here at the Arboretum. And um, I can say that I'm very grateful uh, that it became part of my journey as well. I, I think our discussions uh, about what we were seeing around us, about mental health, um, about what the trees mean to us, um, I think. For someone like myself, who is uh, so passionately into plants and trees um, here at work, uh, when I go home, <laughs> my library at home, my gardens and nurseries at home, uh, you always have that to-do list. You're always thinking about what you need to do with the sequence and the coordination. And uh, you can get very caught up in that. 
especially at a big place like this with so much happening. And um, I think what really resonates that Peter was saying too, how easy it is to forget, uh, to take a moment. And those journeys uh, with, with Don, where we were, were talking about trees and, and, and looking at different ones, and, and Don and asking questions about what this one is, or where did it come from. And uh, it, it kind of you know brings back memories to me about all the little connections you have with all those individuals. Uh, some of them you know from a small seed uh, to become a big tree, and, and, and taking those moments to to actually be with those trees, and, and, and not just be thinking about the next thing you need to be doing, but actually connecting with them. Um, and it, it, it really allowed me to connect with myself um, in ways to, to, to feel that, that peace that we're kind of all talking about, being under those trees and the stillness and the silence around you, and uh, you know, acknowledging the need to take care of yourself and to take care of your loved ones and the people around you and how the forest can be such a vector for that. It's just such an amazing, connection that we all have deep down, whether we realize it or not. And, um, you know, again, whether you're someone who, uh, like myself, been planting trees his whole life, or just appreciating them uh, just, just for the beauty, um, just for what you're, you're, you're seeing visit them, and, and, um, and obviously all the, the, the things that we can list that help us as humans, all those, those intrinsic values, or all those, uh, you know, we'll see on uh, a lot of discussion about urban forestry, about all the benefits they provide to our cities and things like that. And it's all true, but certainly that 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 mental health connection uh, is so important because we are part of that forest as well. And I think we remove ourselves from it so often we forget about that connection. And, and myself included, being someone who's around trees all the time, it's taking that moment to stop and and to be with them. And um, said it is really fun for me to do those walks because we could really talk about those things in a, in a way that uh, you sometimes miss out upon in your day to day and, um, and I really value that so it's been, been wonderful to be a part of that team and to obviously uh, connect with other people who are part of that team and uh, and learn about this project moving forward and where it's going and, and, and again just you know just reconnecting with myself a little bit too which has been really important so thank you you know uh, interesting what I said about Chris, Sean is similar, but he's not pointing at birds. He's going like this in the sky. He's collecting seeds or something. He's always picking up seeds and collecting seeds and, and probably planted more trees than any of us could ever dream of, which is his dream of life, I guess, which is so cool. So thank you. I'm not going to jump to Chris right now because Chris I want to use on the sit. And I'll explain why. So I'm going to go to a video of Byron. I do this like I do this at work. Um, every morning when we get together, we sit in a big circle. And we, we start the day with a song. I won't sing a song, but um, we also do our opening circle. And it always starts with your name, something you're grateful for, and maybe your parents' names and something you notice in nature. And for me, that's become a big way of setting the stage for something. And So my name is Byron Donald Vincent Murray. Um, my parents' names are Nancy Bernice Hearn, Deborah Lynn Hogan, and Roderick John Murray. You can see a couple of them over here in a photo above me. Um, and what I'm grateful for is this beautiful storm that happened tonight and the chance to, to really witness it out my, out my window while I have to work. I can still see the Aramosa River Valley and look out over uh, as this storm rips through and the wind and the trees and everything. It's just beautiful. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, right now, as of recording this, I'm at home in Guelph in the Aramosa River Valley. Uh, facing the Aramosa River, my face southeast. So across the river is a small stretch of a golf course, and beyond that is the University of Guelph's Arboretum. So I go there often, um, either on a run or just to wander about and look at things, and I'm always there looking at things. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just a really beautiful spot. And, one thing I do for work is I work at the Guelph Outdoor School, which is a little bit to the south of me, maybe a little bit to the southeast, a bit more, pardon me, a bit to the east of me. Um, and there I work with kids and adults. I'm a senior instructor. I've been there since 2014, hanging out with kids and adults outside in the woods or in the fields, in the river, on the river when it freezes over. 
and we just go and explore and we play and we wander and wonder about the, the beautiful valley that we happen to inhabit. And it's become through that work, a bit of a mission of mine to get to know the Aramos River Valley as you might get to know someone in your family. And that's inspired many projects, one of which is a radio show that I've had since 2016 airing at the university entitled To Know the Land. And it's just about how people connect with the land base, how we learn about the land, how we interact with the land base. And that's just my, my big goal right now. How do people learn to live with the land in, in a good way, in, uh, in ways that are positive and healing for, for us and for the land? And I think that this project does a lot of that. You know, I think that this project is, is, is a step towards that, uh, that healing process for individuals um, coming to terms with maybe or, or working with and learning how to be within themselves in relationship, not only to the human, but to the more than human, to the world that exists beyond us and how important that is. I know for me, my relationship with the land base has been so grounding, so healing and such a beautiful gift. And I know that through projects like this, we can endeavor towards that. And I know it's, it's going to be different for everybody's experience. Everybody's going to have a new thing or a different way of interacting with the land or interacting with themselves through this process. But that's part of the journey. That's part of the connection building relationship and that's the whole point just building relationship something that many cultures around the world have lost i know my ancestral culture has become quite disconnected so it's tapping into that maybe prehistoric or or older ways of being that let us learn to be with the land let us learn to talk with the trees maybe or listen to the trees and just remembering that and, and putting it back together within us and between us. So I think that that's really important. And I'm really appreciative of this project for that. So that's Byron. And I, uh, with him, when I walk with him, um, he's so curious. He hardly moves because he is not looking at, well, he looks at birds and trees and seeds, but he's always looking food, which is a very funny thing to say, but he's also interested in who lives in the land and he sees it and inspects it and knows who's eaten what where and he's fantastic to walk with. The next person is Mamona Hossein, who is a um, eco-psychologist, uh, mother, and environmental activist, and she couldn't be here today. She's at a wedding, so I wanted to um, share you her, her, her talk, and she's from Brampton, and she would come down and meet with the student as well, and it's met me in as well. Hello. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In the Islamic tradition, that means may the peace, blessings, and mercy of the Creator be upon all of you. My name is Maimuna Hussain, and I'm sorry I'm not able to be there with all of you today. However, I am very excited to be a part of this project. I am speaking to you from my home in the Peel region, uh, which is part of the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I am a mother. And I start by that uh, because I think that that's an important, a really important part of who I am in terms of thinking about how I am nurtured by life and how I also am a part of nurturing life. And I think of uh, that in terms of trees, how trees are so much a part of nurturing life and, uh, you know, being a part of that attractive life force. I am also uh, studying eco psychology. I am uh, working on my towards my PhD in eco psychology, which looks at the um, explores the uh, connective holistic relationship of humans and the earth. And I've also uh, done my master's of education at U of T. So I look at combining those two pieces in terms of uh, education and eco psychology. And I've had the opportunity to teach at uh, the University of Guelph Arboretum, actually eco psychology and eco art therapy. And um, I also have worked in uh, the field of mental health, disabilities and addictions for over 15 years. And I bring that and that's a 
part of who I am as well. And um, I also am a community activist in terms of uh, I, I look at, you know, I'm intrigued and look at areas that, uh, you know, need action. And uh, particularly, I have served on the National Executive Council, as well as the Board of Directors for the Muslim Association of Canada. And uh, when I think of this project, how to draw a tree, uh, this concept of drawing a tree is so interesting and so unique to me in the sense that, uh, you know, draw being drawn towards, but also draw meaning developing a relationship uh, you know, physically actually drawing, artistically drawing, and so many aspects of actually building that understanding, that connection, and that knowing of what a tree is. You know, we think of uh, mental health and we think of, you know, a student's life uh, on campus being an exciting part of one's life, but also a part that may have many challenges like so many phases of our lives. And when we look at nature, the earth and trees, one of the things that is so fascinating to me is that uh, we connect through verbal language for most of our lives, yet the entire earth uh, communicates in this nonverbal form and often when we are feeling like we need to get away or we need uh, peace and quiet we retreat to somewhere in nature and we connect with nature yet we don't necessarily speak in those ways of words and so what is that really deep connection that sense of awe that we get that helps us heal grow connect what are trees doing to us what are trees giving to us when we think of it it is just beyond phenomenal, miraculous, really. And uh, this project brings that and actually gives a space to give life to that conversation to really think about that. And I love this because of that. And I think that this is really groundbreaking and trailblazing in so many ways. And I hope that it will give uh, life and uh, to so much more um, in terms of thinking about that connection, that healing process that we can have with trees and think about thinking about that nonverbal uh, relationship that uh, trees can give us. Uh, and there's so much that we can learn when I think of an eco psychology psychology perspective in terms of, uh, you know, just sitting with a tree, simply the act of sitting and being there with a tree uh, can really uh, have so much chemically, psychologically, emotionally, physically. And I'm glad that we will be, you know, having the opportunity to think about this and explore this. And I'm grateful to also be a part of this project with so many unique individuals and to really learn from them and grow with them. And uh, I look forward to meeting uh, many of you, hopefully, through this journey. So thank you so much. So um, that once the tree is chosen, uh, what we um, are, what I, what I have done is I invited Chris to come sit with me, and Chris early. And Chris, to me, is very much about community and relationships, and what happens um, in nature, and who. Um, and, well, Chris, I'll tell you. Why am I telling this? <laughs> Pass it over, Chris. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I don't know if I can follow so, such such eloquent speakers. Peter Ramona and John Byron. Um, uh, it's, it is an honor to, to be a part of this project, um, just like it's, it's an honor to actually be a part of the Arboretum. So I am the Interpretive Biologist and Education Coordinator here. I'm in my 29th year um, working here and uh, volunteered here before that. Um, I guess it's, you know, as, as someone, so I was that nature kid, so I grew up in a small town, and I was the kid that, oh, you have a snake in your window well, oh, you should call Chris, you know, he's only eight, but he'll help you. And uh, so I've been sort of doing this my, my whole life, so it's kind of a neat, a neat thing to have a career that you've had literally since you were probably three or four years old, but without knowing it, of course. And what's, what's amazing about this project is, is not just what's happened already and, uh, and sitting with, you know, Old Lumpy and, and, uh, and, and Don and, and experiencing that, but, but having that opportunity to know that this is going to go beyond and go to students 
who, um, you know, really young people are, are the ones that are going to make the difference. And so we need to be able to, to foster that. And this, this is just, it's a great place to do it in this project. So thank you for getting this project going. Is, is a wonderful um, opportunity for that to happen. Um, I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me yesterday. So uh, this, so students are back, which is so amazing. Uh, I miss them so much. And uh, uh, in the last couple of days, I've done a whole bunch of uh, labs and tours uh, with student groups. And one of them yesterday was a new, a new group that I've never talked to before, and it's actually a business class. So a business class that wanted to come out, so the prof wanted to bring them out, so that they could learn some ecological sort of principles and relate those to business models, which is pretty awesome, right? But at the same time, as, as the instructor for this tour, I'm like, uh, okay. So, so this is a new one. And how am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna do this? But you know, I always know that once I'm out there, that nature is going to provide everything that I need to be able to share this, this experience with the students. And so the first thing I did with the students, I took them into Wild Goose Woods, which is an old growth forest. It's always been there. And instead of me starting to talk, I decided, okay, let's, how many of these students actually spend time in a forest? So I had them sit down on the boardwalk. I said, so before we even go, I'm going to say, find a spot on this boardwalk, sit down, and it would have been better to have them sit down right on the ground, but it was a wet area, because that's why there's a boardwalk. So they, uh, they had them sit on the boardwalk, and they said, five minutes. So we're just going to sit here for five minutes. All I need you is, if you're here with a friend, is to not sit near your friend so that you don't chat. I want you to just spend five minutes you know, off your phone, no headphones, just looking into this forest. And... At about two and a half minutes, a mink pops up in front of the whole class. Okay? And so you don't know mink. So this is in a spot where every winter where I can track, there are mink tracks all over the place in this part of the forest. I have never in 29 years actually seen a mink there. Okay? And within that, because I was looking at my watch and I look up and I go, oh, there's a little squirrel in that, and I'm like, wait a minute, and then it comes out, and this mate comes out onto a fallen log, crawls up the log, looks at everyone on the boardwalk, <laughs> crawls back down the log, goes around the forest floor looking for food, crawls up half, uh, part way up a tree stump that, that it, uh, that it, the tree was alive, but one part of it had been, had been a stump, and peeked over the edge, looked at everyone, went down, and then walked along the boardwalk past all of the students, <laughs> and so, I guess just, you know, you never know what is going to happen and what your inspiration might be, but you're going to miss it if you don't take the time to sit there and listen. We're so used to doing all the talking and always doing something that we, we need to sort of step back and listen to what a forest has to say to us or what a meadow might whisper to us or what a pond might, you know, give us, because it's all, it's all happening. We just have to, we have to just accept it. And that's why this project is so great, because it's, it's hard for people to wrap their mind around that, but a tree is, it's right there. So you can focus on that tree, as an, you're an individual, the tree's an individual, but not really individual because it supports so much life and that's what that's what this project I think is going to help people with is 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 sort of get get out of themselves to see things and then go back in with a comfort that that really nature is, is the only thing that can give that sort of particular comfort and uh, so I thank you for, for doing this project because I think it's going to be um, it's going to be spectacular. So, yeah, thank you, Chris. It was interesting. The particular tree I've chosen has a ton of um, galls on it, which are these lumps with an insect inside. And Chris told me that I'm also going to have to be in a relationship with those because it's all part of it. <laughs> the tree. I just want to tell you that we are 10 minutes over. I have two people left to introduce you to. Me. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so that'll be about another seven minutes. And then at the very end, I do have a side project I, for anyone that can stay. It's going to be about 10 minutes long, which is Chris reference is called Old Lumpy. I did with Doug Larson and the Exhibition Park Neighborhood Group and a couple friends from Exhibition Park are here. And it's a tree with an answering machine. So feel free to leave when you need to leave because I know we're over time. But I will introduce two more people. And then we're going to just play the audio from the answering machine. Um, uh, so we'll be probably finishing here at about 12, uh, 1225. So just letting everyone know, don't feel it's rude to go. Um, I'm going to hop over here before I get to Wongi again. And Wongi, do you want me to introduce you or do you want to chat? Uh, so, you know, not everybody is uh, interested in public speak. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate Wongi coming sitting up here. And he was like, just sit up here with us. <laughs> So I'm going to meet, introduce you to someone from the forest at the other end of town, who I met on a um, board for the Arts Council, and he ended up asking me about my project. And this person is a priest, but first and foremost is a poet and someone who is a farmer. They work in farm, and they also are um, an absolute tree lover. So this person is in Dominican, actually Haiti right now, he was in Dominican when they sent this video for us. It's a short one. He's also a meditator uh, and sitting there for a month beside a tree, meditating, uh, beginning next week. Hi there, my name is Greg Kennedy. I am here sweating in Santo, Dom Santo Domingo, D Dominican Republic. Normally I'd be greeting you from Guelph, Ontario at the Ignatius Jesuit Center at the other end of town from the Arboretum, where I work as a Jesuit priest and a spiritual director. Spiritual direction is a bit of an odd name for what I do. Basically, I listen to people and try to help them see providence working in their lives. Providence being that benign force looking for the good of each creature, each being in the world. So my participation in this project will be to help those people with their trees, to listen to the trees, uh, because through trees we learn um, great things about ourselves, or our own fragility, our own solidity, our own perseverance, uh, our own rootedness, our own ability to grow towards light. So all that I'll help, hopefully, help people experience and enjoy. Uh, my own experience with trees is, is really quite long-standing all my life. I've been great friends with trees. I don't think it's any accident that the Buddha was enlight found enlightenment under a tree, that Jesus was uh, died embracing a tree. So trees have always been significant to me. I, my kind of practice is to hug and kiss one each day, if I can be so intimate with you. And uh, great, great friends. So I am thoroughly pleased and excited to be in this project, and I hope that you too will find great goodness in it. Thank you. Hi there, it's me again. I wanted to add a postscript to my nervous video that I shot yesterday. A little poem came to me this morning, and I always think more clearly in poetry and this poem uh, explains why I think this project is so important. But before the poem, I want to introduce you to a little friend of mine. This is uh, the roots of a neem tree, which I have been trying to liberate from all the, the mud and sand. So let me read you a poem. The tree unseen feels and grips and speaks truly in languages below sound with tongues not its own. And slowly she who walks slowly above, and slowly he who weeps gently into its grip, and slowly they who truly touch the trunk coming out of tongues below sound, see the tree unseen, with eyes not their own, with eyes multiplied into forests, speaking languages no body has ever learned, not he, not she, not they, except by full immersion. Okay, um, so, I forgot to make again. so um, yeah, he kind of communicates the poetry. So, Wongi also said that if anybody wants to chat afterwards, uh, he'll be here. I'll just speak a little bit about Wongi and how I approached him. Because um, uh, I already know what uh, my Understanding is the neat story he told me he lives downtown with his wife, Michelle, right here. Sorry, everyone out there, Bob is got a single. Just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, um, the, uh, he lives downtown and he said he's had children here in Canada. He said he could, he's from Kenya originally, couldn't uh, feel like he was a Canadian until he planted trees. 
So he's been planting fruit trees all over the boulevard, and the city's <laughs> telling him to take them up. He puts other fruit trees in, and so learning that about Mwangi and resilience in his life and his background, uh, coffee plantation in, in Kenya, and the fact that he works up here um, planting trees himself, uh, and how much he tends and cares to him. And his manager, John Reinhardt, said you couldn't find someone better to go tend and care for trees than Mwangi. So we've been sanctioned to use Mwangi uh, on this project to plant these sister trees on campus that we'll link here. So um, thank you for being up here, Mwangi. So I'm going to wrap up because we're over, but whoever can stay, I'm going to play. Um, I'm sorry if there's a ton of questions. I am going to play the uh, old monkey. Just to me. Just before you go, um, thank you all. I want to say that both Charlie and Chris are going to be leading walks here at 1 o'clock. Um, and there's some music and things outside. So as you uh, as you leave, there's some other things that can be. If you'd like to participate in a walk, there's a little online form you have to sign up for. Uh, you can check that out later. Because I think people will be leaving. Thank you all for this. Thank you very much for providing some space to, to chat about this and for the support. And really, really wonderful. Um, so this is Old Lucky, and this is just a fun, silly project during the COVID when I knew kids in my neighborhood were quite lonely and wanted some friends and not to be alone. So I'll play it, and you can come go as you want. Thank you everybody. Let's get outside. Sorry we went over. Thanks so much for coming. Lots of stuff happening today.